the 8960th meeting of the Security Council is called to order. The provisional agenda for this meeting is threat to international peace and security. The agenda is, I give the floor to the representative of the Russian Federation. Благодарю вас, госпожа председатель. Благодарю вас, госпожа председатель. Госпожа председатель Российской Федерации запрашивает проведение процедурного голосования по предложению провести этот митинг по инициативе Соединенных Штатов. Делегация Соединенных Штатов в пояснении к своему предложению по созыву сегодняшнего заседания указала, что рассматривает расположение российских войск на российской же территории в качестве угрозы международному миру и безопасности. Это является не только неприемлемым вмешательством на внутренние дела нашего государства, но и попыткой введения в заблуждение международного сообщества относительно истинного положения дел в регионе, а также причин существующей глобальной напряженности. По сути, нам сегодня предлагает созвать заседание Совета безопасности из-за домыслов и без, без основательных обвинений, которые мы неоднократно опровергали. Кроме того, предла... неоднократно опровергали. Consistently. Кроме того, предлагаемый в США открытый формат в купе с крайне провокационной темой заседания делает запрашиваемую встречу классическим примером мегафонной дипломатии. Работы на публику. For, for, for the public. Необходимость отказа от которой мы все неоднократно подтверждали. Не думаем, что это помогает сплочению Совета. Наоборот, мы прекрасно понимаем, что стремление наших американских коллег нагнетать истерию вокруг своих же утверждений о якобы готовящейся российской агрессии, задействуя в том числе трибуну Совбеза, ставит наших коллег по Совету Безопасности в крайне неудобное положение. Не меньший вред это нагнетание истерии наносит самой Украине. Президент который, как вы все слышали, на днях просил западные страны как раз не нагнетать беспочвенную истерику вокруг нахождения российских войск на границе, поскольку вся эта шумиха вредит украинской экономике. Нам не нужна эта паника, сказал господин Зеленский. Но нужна она, похоже, тем, кто раскручивает тему мифической российской угрозы. Передо мной лежат высказывания украинских официальных лиц об отсутствии угрозы со стороны России. Это, в частности, секретарь СНБУ Украины, министр обороны Резни, Резников, сам президент Зеленский, которые прямым текстом говорят о том, что они не видят той активности, о которой сегодня нам пытаются сказать. Не буду их цитировать полностью, но готовы распространить среди вас позже. Призываю всех коллег проявить принципиальность и не дать использовать трибуны Совбеза для реализации пропагандистских установок наших западных коллег. Хотели бы также напомнить членам Совета Безопасности, что российская делегация еще в декабре объявила о планах провести ежегодное обсуждение ситуации на Украине в ходе нашего председательства в Совете, которое начинается с завтрашнего дня. Седьмая годовщина принятия комплекса мер по реализации Минских соглашений будет хорошей возможностью для нас в конструктивном духе подтвердить приверженность Совета резолюции 2202 которые являются международно-правовой основой внутриукраинского регулирования. Мероприятие запланировано на 17 февраля. Если же у наших американских коллег есть потребность выдать на публику какие-либо дополнительные сигналы по украинской тематике, они вполне могли бы сделать это в ходе упомянутой мной встречи. 
Призываем всех здравомыслящих членов Совета не поддерживать это провокационное предложение и проявить ответственное отношение к уставу ООН и Совета Безопасности. Благодарю вас. Thank you very much, uh, Madam President. Uh, as our colleague uh, stated, uh, we have called for this meeting. And we've called for this meeting uh, because of what we have all witnessed over the course of the past few months in terms of the actions of the Russian Federation on the territory of, uh, of uh, uh, on the border with Ukraine. Uh, they indicate uh, that uh, it's in their own territory, but it is also very uh, close to their neighbor's border. Uh, it's a neighbor that has been in invaded already before. It's a neighbor that has uh, Russian troops occupying uh, their territory. Uh, we have had numerous meetings, uh, over 100 meetings over the course of the past few weeks, uh, both with uh, Russian officials and in consultations with our European and Ukrainian colleagues, all of these meetings have been in private. We think it's now time to have a meeting in public uh, and uh, have uh, this discussed in a public forum. Uh, we have uh, worked with the Ukrainians uh, at their request uh, to provide assistance to them so that they can prepare for what they see as inevitable, uh, including having provided $200 million uh, in assistance in recent weeks and over $5 billion in assistance since 2014. And that is so that they can be uh, prepared. Uh, you've heard from our Russian colleagues that we're calling for uh, this meeting to make you all feel uncomfortable. Imagine how uncomfortable you would be if you had 100,000 troops sitting on your border uh, in the uh, way that these troops are sitting on the border with Ukraine. Uh, for us, this is about peace and security. It's about honoring the uh, UN Charter uh, that calls up, uh, on us as members of the Security Council to protect peace and security. So this is not about antics. Uh, it's not about rhetoric. It's not about US and Russia. What this is about is the peace and security of, uh, of one of our member states. Uh, thank you very much, Madam President. I thank the representative of the United States. In view of the request and the comments made by members of the Security Council, I intend to put the provisional agenda to a vote. Accordingly, I shall put it to the vote now. Will those in favor of the adoption of the provisional agenda please raise their hand? Those against? Abstention? The result of the voting is as follows. 10 votes in favor, two votes against, three abstentions. The provisional agenda has been adopted. In accordance with Rule 37 of the Council Provisional's Rules of Procedure, I invite the representative of Belarus, Lithuania, Poland, and Ukraine to participate in this meeting. It is so decided. In accordance with Rule 39 of the Council's Provisional Rules of Procedure, I invite Ms. Rosemary Di Carlo, Under Secretary General for Political and Peacebuilding Affairs, to participate 
participate in the meeting. It is so decided. The Security Council will now be in its consideration of item two of the agenda. Recalling the Security Council late, latest note 507 on its working methods, I wish to encourage all speakers, both members and non-members of the Council, to deliver the statements in five minutes or less. Note 507 also encourages briefers to be succinct and to focus on key issues. In this spirit, briefers are further encouraged to limit their initial remarks to seven to 10 minutes. Everyone is also encouraged to wear a mask at all times, including while de delivering remarks. I now give the floor to Rosemary Carlo. Thank you. Madam President, the United Nations is closely following the ongoing diplomatic discussions on the future of European peace and security architecture among representatives of the Russian Federation, the United States, members of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, the European Union, and the Organization for the Security and Cooperation in Europe. We hope the outcome of these talks will strengthen peace and security in Europe, including for Ukraine. Madam President, although not an active participant in these exchanges, in all his contacts, the Secretary General has unequivocally supported the ongoing diplomatic efforts at all levels. Still, we remain greatly concerned that, even as these efforts continue, tensions keep escalating, and a dangerous military buildup is in the heart of Europe. It is reported that over 100,000 troops and heavy weaponry from the Russian Federation are positioned along the border with Ukraine. Unspecified numbers of Russian troops and weaponry are also reportedly being deployed to Belarus ahead of large-scale joint military exercises in February on the borders with Ukraine, Poland, and the Baltic states. NATO members are reportedly planning additional deployments in Eastern European member states, and NATO has advised that 8,500 troops are now on high alert. Accusations and recriminations among the various actors involved in the ongoing discussions have created uncertainty and apprehension for many that a military confrontation is impending. Madam President, the Secretary General has made clear that there can be no alternative to diplomacy and dialogue to deal with the complex, long-standing security concerns and threat perceptions that have been raised. He has expressed his strong belief that there should not be any military intervention in this context and that diplomacy should prevail. He's been equally explicit that any such intervention by one country in another would be against international law and the United Nations Charter. His expectation is that we all contribute to avoiding confrontation and to creating conditions for a diplomatic solution to end this crisis. We therefore welcome the steps taken so far by all involved to maintain dialogue. We urge and expect all actors to build on these efforts and to remain focused on pursuing diplomatic solutions by engaging in good faith. We further urge all actors to refrain from provocative rhetoric and actions to maximize the chance for diplomacy to succeed. Achieving mutual understanding and lasting, mutually acceptable arrangements is the best way to safeguard regional and international peace and security in the interest of all. Madam President, let me repeat the full commitment of the United Nations to the sovereignty, political independence, unity, and territorial integrity of Ukraine within its internationally recognized borders in accordance with relevant General Assembly resolutions. It is important, especially at this time, for the international community to intensify its support for the efforts of the Normandy Four and of the OSCE-led Trilateral Contact Group to ensure the implementation of the Minsk Agreements endorsed by this Council in its Resolution 2202. 
we welcome the recent meeting of the Normandy Four Advisors in Paris and their agreement to reconvene shortly in Berlin as another sign that diplomacy can work. We commend these efforts and those of the OSCE Special Monitoring Mission. Likewise, United Nations agencies in Ukraine are committed to continue delivering on their mandates in accordance with the humanitarian principles of neutrality, impartiality, humanity, and independence. Safe, unimpeded humanitarian access must be respected under any circumstances to provide support to the 2.9 million people in need of assistance with the majority and non-government controlled areas. In this regard, I encourage member states to contribute to the humanitarian response plan. Further, the UN Human Rights Monitoring Mission in Ukraine continues to document civilian casualties in the conflict area. Madam President, no one is watching the current diplomatic efforts more than the people of Ukraine. They have endured a conflict that has taken over 14,000 lives since 2014, and that tragically is still far from resolution. It is painfully obvious that any new escalation in or around Ukraine would mean more needless killing and destruction. Whatever one's position regarding the current situation or the status, of, the status quo in Eastern Ukraine, this should be inconceivable. The fact that it is not should give us pause. The principles enshrined in the UN Charter, the Helsinki Final Act, and multiple other commitments to safeguard regional and international peace and security are crystal clear. Any escalation or new conflict would deal another serious blow to the architecture so painstakingly built up over the last 75 years to maintain international peace and security just when we need it most. Once again, I'd like to stress the Secretary General's appeal to all concerned to take immediate steps to de-escalate tensions and continue on the diplomatic path. The United Nations stands ready to, all, uh, to support all efforts to that end. Thank you, Madam President. I thank Rosemary DiCarlo for her briefing. I now give the floor to those council members who wish to make statements. I give the floor to the representative of the United States. Thank you, Madam President. And thank you, Under Secretary General DiCarlo, for your briefing. Colleagues, the situation we're facing in Europe is urgent and dangerous. And the stakes for Ukraine and for every UN member state could not be higher. Russia's actions strike at the very heart of the UN Charter. This is as clear and consequential a threat to peace and security as anyone can imagine. In the wake of World War II, the Council was formed to address precisely the kind of threat that Ukraine now faces. As Article 39 says, the Security Council shall determine the existence of any threat to the peace. Thus, our charge is not only to address conflicts after they occur, but also to prevent them from happening in the first place. This is why today's meeting is so crucial. Russia's aggression today not only threatens Ukraine, it also threatens Europe. It threatens the international order this body is charged with upholding. An order that if it stands for anything, stands for the principle that one country cannot simply redraw another country's borders by force or make another country's people live under a government they did not choose. We continue to hope Russia chooses the path of diplomacy over the path of conflict in Ukraine, but we cannot just wait and see. It is crucial that this council address the risk that their aggressive and destabilizing behavior poses across the globe. First, let's be clear about the facts. Russia has assembled a massive military force of more than 100,000 troops along, the Ukraine's, along Ukraine's border. 
These are combat forces and special forces prepared to conduct offensive actions into Ukraine. This is the largest, this is the largest, hear me clearly, mobilization of troops in Europe in decades. And as we speak, Russia is sending even more forces and arms to join them. Russia has already used more than 2,000 rail cars to move troops and weaponry from across Russia to the Ukrainian border. Russia has also moved nearly 5,000 troops into Belarus with short-range ballistic missiles, special forces, and anti-aircraft batteries. We've seen evidence that Russia intends to expand that presence to more than 30,000 troops near the Belarus-Ukraine border, less than two hours north of Kyiv by early February. In addition to military activity, we've also seen a dramatic spike in cyber attacks on Ukraine in recent weeks. Russian military and intelligence services are spreading disinformation through state-owned media and proxy sites, and they are attempting without any factual basis to paint Ukraine and Western countries as the aggressors to fabricate a pretext for attack. Russia's military buildup on the border has been paired with extensive new demands and aggressive rhetoric. This is an escalation and a pattern of aggression that we've seen from Russia again and again. In 2014, Russia illegally invaded and seized Crimea. In 2008, Russia invaded Georgia. Russian troops are currently refusing to depart Moldova despite the wishes of the Moldovan people and their democratically elected government. And in the Donbas region of Ukraine, Russian-backed separatists continue to foment and ignore violence toward the Ukrainian people. Recently, Russia has threatened to take military action should its demands not be met. If Russia further invades Ukraine, none of us will be able to say we didn't see it coming. And the consequences will be horrific, which is why this meeting is so important today. Already Russians, Russia's war in eastern Ukraine has killed more than 14,000 Ukrainians, nearly 3 million Ukrainians, half of whom are elderly people and children, need food, shelter, and life-saving assistance. Devastating as this situation is, it would pale in comparison to the humanitarian impact of the full-scale land invasion Russia is currently planning in Ukraine. Over the years, Russian leaders have claimed that Ukraine is not a real country and questioned its right to self-determination. So let's be clear. Ukraine is a UN member state that recently celebrated three decades of independence. It has a proud people and a rich culture. Ukraine is a sovereign country and a sovereign people entitled to determine their own future without the threat of force. This is not just the conviction that Ukrainians hold. It is a right enshrined by the UN Charter a right that Russia and every other member of this institution has freely committed to upholding. Our international order is not perfect, but it is grounded in respect for people and countries to govern themselves, to defend themselves, and to associate with whom they choose. All countries have a stake in defending and preserving these principles, and nothing could be more fundamental. What would it mean for the world if former empires had license to start reclaiming territory by force? This would set us down a dangerous path. Russia could, of course, choose a different path, the path of diplomacy. In recent weeks, the United States, along with our European allies and partners and other nations around the globe, concerned by Russia's threat to Ukraine, have continued to do everything we can to resolve this crisis peacefully. In all of these talks, our messages have been clear and consistent. We seek the path of peace. We seek the path of dialogue. 
We do not want confrontation, but we will be decisive, swift, and united should R Russia further invade Ukraine. We continue to believe there is a diplomatic path out of the crisis caused by Russia's unprovoked military buildup. We're working to pursue diplomacy in every possible venue. But we also know that diplomacy will not succeed in an atmosphere of threat and military escalation. That is why we have brought this situation before the Security Council today. The United States has been clear. If this is truly about Russia's security concerns in Europe, we're offering them an opportunity to address these concerns at the negotiating table. The test of Russia's good faith in the coming days and weeks is whether they will come to that table and stay at that table until we reach an understanding. If they refuse to do so, the world will know why and who is responsible. Fellow members of the Council and other UN member states, we urge you to assess not only Russia's statements, but their actions with clear eyes to evaluate the risk this, pres this presents not just to Ukraine's border and its people, but to all of us. And to speak clearly and forcefully in favor of the path of diplomacy rather than the path of conflict. Thank you, Madam President. I thank the representative of the United States, and I give the floor to the representative of Albania. Thank you, Madam President, for convening this open meeting, and thank you, Under Secretary General Di Carlo, for your briefing. Madam President, the primary responsibility of the Security Council is to maintain peace and security with a view to preventing conflicts in the world. We have argued sev here several times that in terms of prevention, the Council has still a long way to go. The Council has been seized many times to discuss the situation in Ukraine since the beginning of the aggression in 2014. And here we are again today. We express our deep concerns on the military buildup of Russia near Ukraine in recent months. Dozens of battalions have been already dislocated to the Ukrainian border. Military troops are being dispatched from eastern to western part of Russia. This includes heavy combat forces, tanks, artillery, air defense systems, and ballistic missiles. Several thousands of Russian troops have also been sent to Belarus. This movement of troops and weaponry, weaponry is very worrying, has caused anxiety and fear among people in Ukraine, and justifiably serious international concerns, particularly for us in Europe. Madam President, let me reconfirm our unwavering support for the sovereignty and territorial integrity of Ukraine within its internationally recognized borders. Dear colleagues, in 1994, 27 years ago, Ukraine received security assurances through the Budapest Memorandum, where Russia, together with US and UK, pledged, and I quote, to respect the independence and sovereignty and the existing borders of Ukraine in exchange for giving up its nuclear arsenal. The signatories also reaffirmed their commitment to seek UN Security Act Council action to provide assistance to Ukraine should it become a victim of an act of aggression. We call on Russia and the Security Council to expressly confirm the respect of the sovereignty and territorial integrity of Ukraine. Madam President, it would be wrong to consider the threat of a military attack by Russia against Ukraine as another crisis between Russia and the West. This is a challenge to the European security order and to the whole international security architecture, which is based on the UN Charter. It is an affront to the 1975 Helsinki Final Act and its Decalogue, upon which OSCE is founded and where Russia is a part. These lost developments on the Russian-Ukrainian border are a well-known playbook. We have seen them in Georgia in 2008 and in Ukraine repeatedly since 2014, unfortunately at the cost of thousands of lives, civilian and military. 
Russia has used military violence as a means of achieving its political and geopolitical goals. Madam President, Russia is a big country and has a role to play in European and world geopolitics. It can play an important part in making the world a better and a safer place. Unfortunately, it is doing the contrary. The narratives of spheres of influence in Europe or dictating by threats the geostrategic orientation of other countries are tools of another century, of another time, reminiscences of the Cold War. Countries are and should be free to join whichever organization they want, be it NATO, the European Union, CSTO, or CIS. Sovereign countries take decisions by their free will, not under the threat of a gun. Madam President, what is to gain in a potential conflict to which everyone anticipates the disastrous consequences? What can justify the loss of thousands of lives, widespread destruction, severance of relations, continued tensions, including, as it has been made repeatedly clear, severe consequences for Russia itself? No other place knows more about war and its disastrous consequences than this room. Therefore, we must be able to see beyond and seek other means to address issues, however complex they are or seem to be. Albena believes that this crisis should be solved through talks and discussion. Finding solutions through negotiations was our primary focus during the OEC chairmanship in office in 2020. It remains the same now in the Council. There are several mechanisms to be used through diplomatic efforts. Concrete steps towards de-escalation are needed, paving the ground towards talks in efforts to seek solutions. Such efforts should be made in good faith and not be conducted in a climate of escalation rhetoric. The resumption of the Normandy format meetings last week in Paris was the right step, and we hope that this process will continue. Madam President, we all should bear in mind that the crisis in and around Ukraine has a direct impact on the whole Europe. The instrumentalization of ethnic minorities, targeted cyber attacks, political interference here and there for political gains, and a growing tendency of genocide denial and glorification on war crimes and war criminals, all these acts that are all these are acts that seek destabilization, create tension, and should be treated as a threat to peace and security because they are. This is why we deem of of paramount importance to invest in prevention, and I hope this meeting will be part of such genuine efforts, and I thank you. I thank the representative of Albania, and I give the floor to the representative of the United Kingdom. Thank you, Madam President, and I'm grateful to Under Secretary General Di Carlo for her briefing. Madam President, the first article of the UN Charter defines our purpose here to take collective measures for the prevention and removal of threats to, to the peace. Today, over 100,000 Russian troops are massed on Ukraine's borders. They are equipped with tanks, armored vehicles, rocket artillery, and short-range ballistic missiles. They are supported by Russian air and maritime long-range strike capabilities. This is not a routine de deployment. This is the largest military buildup in Europe in decades. In the best case scenario, the scale of the Russian forces assembled on three sides of Ukraine is deeply destabilizing. In the worst case, it is preparation for a military invasion of a sovereign country. Madam President, in 2008, Russia told this council that it was sending peacekeepers into Georgia. In reality, it was invading an independent, democratic country. In 2014, Russia denied to this council the presence of its forces in Crimea. In reality, its soldiers were annexing part of an independent, democratic Ukraine. Today, Russia denies that its forces are posing a threat to Ukraine. But yet again, we see disinformation, cyber attacks, and destabilizing plots directed against an independent, democratic country. 
Madam President, the United Kingdom welcomes our discussion today as part of the intense diplomatic efforts to ensure Russia de-escalates de the situation and avoids conflict. We are unwavering in our support for Ukraine's sovereignty, independence and territorial integrity. At the same time, we have sought dialogue with Russia through the OSCE, the NATO-Russia Council and bilateral discussions with all levels of the Russian government. We are ready to address mutual security concerns based on existing European security structures and international commitments. This includes our expectation that Russia should address our concerns. We are committed to a constructive dialogue if Russia is genuine about finding a diplomatic solution. This Council has a vital interest in this diplomatic effort. Because let's be clear, this is not a regional issue. Any Russian invasion or act of aggression against Ukraine would be a gross breach of international law and Russia's commitments under the Charter. Conflict would re result in terrible bloodshed and destabilise the entire international community. There should be no doubt about how costly such a miscalculation would be for Russia, or how devastating it would be for the people of Ukraine, whose only provocation is to want a democratic future for their country. There would be no winners, only victims. Civilians caught in the crossfire or forced to flee. Families grieving the loss of fallen, fallen soldiers on both sides. So, Madam President, we urge Russia to make clear in this Council that it will abide by its obligations under the Charter, that it has no plans to invade Ukraine, that it will refrain from the threat or use of force against its neighbour, that it will not further undermine Ukraine's sovereignty or territorial integrity by military or any other means, and that it will stand down its troops. Thank you, Madam President. I thank the representative of the United Kingdom. I give the floor to the representative of France. Madam la Présidente, la situation aux frontières de l'Ukraine est un motif de vive préoccupation pour la France. L'accumulation de capacités militaires importantes à la frontière d'un État souverain voisin constitue un comportement menaçant. Elle soulève des interrogations légitimes sur les intentions de la Russie, d'autant plus que ce pays a déjà porté atteinte à l'intégrité territoriale de l'Ukraine dans le passé. La France réaffirme son soutien plein et entier à l'indépendance, à la souveraineté et à l'intégrité territoriale de l'Ukraine dans ses frontières internationalement reconnues. Elle appelle la Russie à s'engager dans une désescalade de la situation, à respecter le droit international et à participer de manière constructive au dialogue dans le cadre des mécanismes internationaux établis. La priorité est d'œuvrer collectivement à une désescalade rapide. Le président Macron s'y est employé au cours des derniers jours lors de son déplacement à Berlin, puis de son entretien téléphonique avec le président Poutine. Cette réunion du Conseil de sécurité doit également s'inscrire dans cet objectif. La France soutient tous les efforts de dialogue dans les différents cadres existants et souhaite que les Européens y prennent toute leur part. Dans le cadre du format Normandie, qui rassemble l'Allemagne, la France, la Russie et l'Ukraine, ces efforts ont permis, lors de la réunion du 26 janvier à Paris, de s'accorder sur une déclaration de soutien au respect inconditionnel du cessez-le-feu et de la mise en œuvre des accords de Minsk. Nous poursuivrons les efforts en ce sens lors de la prochaine réunion, prévue à brève échéance à Berlin. Le dialogue quelles que soient les enceintes où il est conduit, doit respecter les principes fondamentaux sur lesquels repose la sécurité européenne, tels qu'établis dans la Charte des Nations Unies, dans les documents fondateurs de l'OSCE 
y compris l'acte final d'Helsinki et la Charte de Paris. Ces principes comprennent notamment l'égalité souveraine et l'intégrité territoriale des États, l'inviolabilité des frontières, le non-recours à la menace ou à l'emploi de la force et la liberté des États de choisir ou de modifier leur propre dispositif de sécurité. Ils ne sont ni négociables, ni sujets à révision ou à réinterprétation. La notion de sphère d'influence n'a pas sa place au XXIe siècle. Si la Russie ne choisit pas la voie du dialogue et du respect du droit international, la réponse sera forte et unie. Toute nouvelle atteinte à la souveraineté et à l'intégrité territoriale de l'Ukraine aura des conséquences massives et un coût sévère. Les Européens travaillent à des mesures restrictives coordonnées et se tiennent prêts, conjointement avec leurs partenaires, à réagir. Si la voie du dialogue et de la coopération est choisie, l'Union européenne est prête à s'engager pour développer ses relations avec la Russie sur la base d'une approche unie, à long terme et stratégique, selon les cinq principes directeurs de 2016. Dans le contexte de menaces et de tensions actuelles, la France réaffirme sa solidarité avec le peuple et le gouvernement ukrainien. Avec nos partenaires européens, nous continuerons à nous mobiliser en soutien à l'Ukraine, notamment par la voie du soutien aux réformes. Je vous remercie. I thank the representative of France and I give the floor to the representative of India. Thank you, Madam President. We have been closely following the evolving developments relating to Ukraine, including through ongoing high-level security talks between the Russian Federation and the United States, as well as under the Normandy format in Paris. India's interest is in finding a solution that can provide for immediate de-escalation of tensions taking into account the legitimate security interests of all countries and aimed towards securing long-term peace and stability in the region and beyond. We have also been in touch with all concerned parties. It is our considered view that the issues can only be resolved through diplomatic dialogue. In this context, we welcome the efforts underway, including under the Minsk Agreement and the Normandy format. Flowing from the recently concluded meeting in Paris under the Normandy format, we also welcome the unconditional observance of the July 2020 ceasefire and reaffirmation of Minsk agreements as the basis of work under the ongoing Normandy format, in particular, commitment of all sides to reduce disagreements on the way forward. We also welcome their agreement to meet in Berlin in two weeks. We urge all parties to continue to engage through all diplomatic channels and to keep working towards the full implementation of the Minsk package. Quiet and constructive diplomacy is the need of the hour. Any steps that increase tension may best be avoided by all sides in the larger interest of securing international peace and security. More than 20,000 Indian students and nationals live and study in different parts of Ukraine, including in its border areas. The well-being of Indian national is of priority to us. Madam President, I reiterate our call for the peaceful resolution of the situation by sincere and sustained diplomatic efforts to ensure that concerns of all sides are resolved through constructive dialogue. I thank you, Madam President. Thank the representative of India, and I give the floor to the representative of Ghana. Thank you very much, Madam President. A few moments ago, this council voted to adopt the agenda for this meeting to consider the situation in Ukraine. Our responsibility for the maintenance of international peace and security makes it imperative to encourage the path of dialogue and preventive diplomacy. That is the only way to end the tensions, bridge the differences between the parties, and forge a unified and pacific position on the situation in Ukraine. Let me begin by thanking Rosemary DiCarlo, USG for Political Affairs and Peace Building for the briefing. I also welcome the participation 
of the representatives of Ukraine, Belarus, Poland, and Lithuania in this meeting. Ghana has been following closely the situation in Ukraine. I've also listened carefully to the briefing we just received from the Secretariat, as well as the statement of delegations that have spoken before me. We have paid careful attention to the perspectives of the key parties to the situation and hope that at the end of this meeting, the views of members of this council will be closer to each other than when we first began. We note from the situation in Ukraine that while there has been a buildup of Russian troops at the internationally recognized borders of Ukraine, those troops are presently within the national territory of the Russian Federation. We also have taken note that while the military buildup of the troops of the Russian Federation are within its borders, this has caused for Ukraine and other parties a concern over the intentions of the buildup and its prospective implications on international peace and security. We therefore welcome the ongoing dialogue between the Russian Federation and the United States to address primary and secondary security concerns that have implications on the situation in Ukraine, as well as the recent face-to-face -face dialogue between the representatives of the Russian Federation and Ukraine under the Normandy format in Paris. After several months of no contact, to enhance trust and remove possibilities of an accidental incident. We note with concern the implications the situation has had on the economy of Ukraine and neighboring markets, and welcome in this regard the call by the President of Ukraine for an easing of the strong narratives on the situation. This must be a time for confidence building to facilitate a restoration of normalcy uh, for the people of Ukraine. In concluding, Madam President, Ghana believes that in conformity with the provisions of the charter of this organization, differences between member states should only be resolved through peaceful means. We remain encouraged by the ongoing diplomatic engagement between the parties and reiterate our support for those efforts which should also take into account the delicate nature of the situation. I thank you very much for your kind attention. I thank the representative of Ghana. I give the floor to the representative of Ireland. Thank you very much, Madam President, and thanks also to Under Secretary General De Carlo for your briefing. Madam President, today's discussion is an important opportunity for the Council to address the developing situation at Ukraine's borders, which has become a matter of profound international concern. Let me underline at the outset that Ireland, along with our EU partners, is a strong and unwavering supporter of Ukraine's independence, sovereignty and territorial integrity within its internationally recognised borders. At this moment of rising tension on Ukraine's frontiers, arising from Russia's military build-up, Ireland calls for calm, de-escalation and the pursuit of diplomacy. We call also for constructive and determined engagement on all dialogue tracks, including the Normandy format and the OSCE. Ireland is fully committed to the core principles enshrined in the UN Charter. These include the sovereign, equality and territorial integrity of states. We recall today that these principles were agreed collectively and freely by all members of the United Nations. Moreover, European security is built on a series of essential commitments and obligations. It is the fundamental right of a sovereign and independent state to chart its own path in the world, to choose its own foreign policy, and to make arrangements for the security and defence of its territory. The Helsinki Final Act, one of the foundational documents of the OSCE, confirms the obligation of states, and I quote, to respect each other's sovereign equality and the right of every state to juridical equality, to territorial integrity, and to freedom and political independence, end of quote. Subsequent agreements, including the Charter of Paris and the Charter of European Security, agreed in Istanbul in 1999, reaffirm the core principles and underpinning collective European security. Madam President, earlier this month, Ireland marked 100 years of a hard-won independence. Just as we would not accept another state determining our foreign and security policy, Ukraine similarly has the sovereign right to choose its own policies. In this Council, we are too often faced with the terrible humanitarian consequences 
of violent conflict, usually where diplomacy and dialogue have failed. Force is never the answer. It is not the answer now. What is needed now, above all, is a negotiated diplomatic solution that reinforces our collective security in Europe. We have the institutions and the mechanisms within which to pursue this solution. Let us use them. Absent that, it will be innocent civilians who once again pay the awful price of conflict. Madam President, that is not a prospect any of us wish to contemplate. Thank you. I thank the representative of Ireland and I give the floor to the representative of China. Thank you, Mr. Chang,美方要求阿里會舉行公開會的理由是,俄羅斯在烏克蘭邊界的兵力部署對國際和平與安全構成威脅。中方不能認同這樣的看法。近期圍繞烏克蘭問題確實出現一些緊張局勢。我们正在关注引起紧张局势的原因。以美国为首的一些国家声称最近在乌克兰会发生战争，但俄罗斯已经一再的声明，俄方没有发起军事行动的计划。乌克兰方面也明确表示，他们不需要战争。在此情况下，
，一国安全不能以损害他国安全为代价，地区安全更不能以强化甚至扩张军事集团为保障。在二十一世纪的今天，各方应当摒弃冷战思维。通过谈判形成均衡、有效、可持续的欧洲安全机制。俄罗斯的合理关切应当得到重视和解决。谢谢你，主席女士。I thank the representative of China, and I give the floor to the representative of the Russian Federation. Благодарю вас, госпожа председатель. Благодарим госпожу Дикарло за брифинг. Я прежде всего хочу поблагодарить те страны, которые нашли в себе, в себе возможность проголосовать против или воздержаться против предложения Соединенных Штатов обсуждать сегодняшнюю тему. У кого-то может сложиться впечатление, как будто бы Россия опасается обсуждать ситуацию на Украине и поэтому затеяла процедурное голосование. Россия вовсе не отказывается обсуждать ситуацию на Украине. Но нам совершенно непонятно, что мы сегодня здесь обсуждаем. И зачем вообще мы здесь находимся. Как я уже говорил, на 17 февраля мы запланировали заседание в ходе нашего председательства о седьмой годовщине реализации Минских соглашений. Где мы как раз можем поговорить о ситуации с украинским урегулированием. Но сегодняшнее заседание вовсе не об этом. В последнее время мы сталкиваемся с весьма необычной, даже по меркам нашего неспокойного времени ситуации. Перемещение российских войск в пределах нашей собственной территории, неоднократно происходившее и ранее в тех или иных масштабах, и не вызывавшее никакой истерики. военнослужащих войск, которые находятся в местах своей дислокации, где они были и раньше, а вовсе не на российско-украинской границе. Так вот, это перемещение российских войск на нашей территории выдается нашими американскими и западными коллегами за подтверждение якобы планируемой военной акции, и даже агрессии, причем американский поспред сказал это так, как будто эта агрессия уже состоялась. Я внимательно слушал его выступление. Военные акции России против Украины, до которой, как они всех убеждают, осталось, остались считанные недели, если не дни. При этом никаких доказательств, подтверждающих столь серьезные обвинения, не приводится. Однако это не мешает раздуть истерию до такой степени, что конкретные экономические последствия уже начали ощущать на себе наши украинские соседи. Наши западные коллеги говорят о необходимости деэскалации, но прежде всего сами нагнетают напряженность, риторику и провоцируют эскалацию. Разговоры о грядущей войне сами по себе провокационны. Вы как будто призываете к этому, хотите и ждете, когда это произойдет. Как будто вы хотите сделать реальностью ваши домыслы. Это несмотря на то, что мы постоянно опровергаем эти обвинения. И это при том, что ни одной угрозы о планированном вторжении на Украину, на Украину из уст кого-либо из российских политиков или общественных деятелей за все это время не прозвучало. Наоборот, мы на всех уровнях категорически опровергали подобные обвинения. Делаем это и сейчас. Все, кто утверждает обратное, вводят вас в заблуждение. Вообще, если бы не наши западные коллеги, которые спровоцировали и поддержали в 2014 году кровавый антиконституционный переворот, приведший к власти в Киеве националистов, радикалов, русофобов и просто нацистов. Нацист. 
Мы бы и по сей день жили бы в духе добрососедства и взаимовыгодного сотрудничества. Однако кому-то на Западе подобный сценарий явно не по душе. Происходящая сегодня еще одна попытка вбить клин между Россией и Украиной. Из-за геополитических игр наши соседи страдают вот уже 7 лет. Украинцам активно промывают мозги, культивируют русофобские радикальные настроения, приучая к мысли о том, что для светлого будущего Украине нужно не налаживать отношения с соседями, а любой ценой стремиться в Евросоюз и НАТО. Запрещают русский язык, родной для значительной части, если не большинства украинцев. Провоцирует церковный раскол. Дивайд. Делают героями тех, кто воевал на стороне Гитлера, уничтожал евреев, поляков, украинцев и русских. Интересы украинского народа в этой разрушительной игре наши западные коллеги не учитывают. Их задача не допустить естественного братского существования, сосуществования наших двух стран и народов, стран и народов, стран и народов, которые разрушили бы планы по ослаблению России, формированию вокруг нее дуги нестабильности. Собственно, ничего нового мы здесь не видим. Подобные действия в духе разделяя и властвуй были divide and rule. Были характерны для западных государств и ранее. Примечательно также, что наши американские коллеги искусственно вписывают самими же созданную мнимую напряженность на российско-украинской границе в запущенный по нашему настоянию переговорный процесс по обеспечению для России юридически обязывающих гарантий безопасности. Ими сознательно создается впечатление, что Москва якобы специально нагнетает напряженность, чтобы потом разменять ее на большую уступчивость США и НАТО. Если вы посмотрите на график и на сам этот переговорный процесс, то вы увидите, что подобные измышления в корне не верны. Все как раз наоборот. Наши западные коллеги пытаются на гребне этой волны свести наш диалог исключительно к вопросу так называемого урегулирования ситуации на границе с Украиной. Наши же требования по безопасности гораздо шире. И не вступление Украины в НАТО, и не размещение на ее территории иностранных войск всего лишь один элемент назревших договоренностей, которые могли бы кардинально улучшить военно-политическую обстановку в Европе, да и в мире в целом. А такого рода, о такого рода договоренностях шла речь на саммитах ОБСЕ в Стамбуле и Астане, где помимо свободы выбора союзов содержалось положение о том, о том что Безопасность одних государств не может обеспечиваться за счет безопасности других. Раз уж наши американские коллеги собрали нас сегодня, то пусть они предъявят хоть какие-то доказательства, кроме измышлений, о том, что Россия собирается напасть на Украину. В выступлении моей американской коллеги было достаточно обвинений в агрессивных действиях России, но ни одного конкретного факта. Кстати, я хочу задать вопрос не только, не только нашим коллегам из США, но и тем, кто упоминал. Откуда взялась цифра в 100 тысяч, в 100 тысяч военнослужащих, которые расположены, как вы утверждаете, на российско-украинской границе, хотя это не так? Мы нигде эту цифру не называли и не подтверждали. Мы помним эти приемы еще с тех пор, как покойный госсекретарь США Колин Пауэлл размахивал в этом зале пробиркой с неизвестным веществом в качестве доказательства наличия АМУ в Ираке. 
Оружие так и не нашли, но что стало со страной, всем хорошо известно. Похоже, что и Украину наши американские коллеги готовы принести в жертву своим геополитическим интересам. Иначе сложно объяснить, почему, собирая нас сегодня, инициаторы встречи не прислушались даже к мнению президента Украины, просившего Запад не нагнетать панику, уже губительно сказывающегося на экономической ситуации в этой стране. Иначе также сложно объяснить, зачем наши коллеги из США и ряда других стран активно накачивают Украину оружием и боеприпасами. И при этом говорят об этом с гордостью. Оружием, которое та с готовностью применяет против мирного населения на востоке собственной страны. И все это делается в нарушении минских договоренностей, утвержденных Советом Безопасности ООН, в качестве единственной основы для мирного урегулирования внутриукраинского конфликта. Кстати, моя американская коллега упоминала, что в ходе конфликта погибло 14 тысяч человек. Я бы хотел порекомендовать ей почитать доклады специальной мониторинговой миссии ОБСЕ и посмотреть, на какой стороне сколько погибло людей из этих 14 тысяч. Большинство из этих людей – это гражданское население Донбасса, погибшего от обстрелов вооруженных сил Украины и национальных батальонов. Госпожа председатель, маневры США вокруг созыва нашей сегодняшней встречи особенно неадекватны и лицемерны на фоне того, что именно американцы имеют рекордные показатели присутствия войск за пределами своей территории. Американские военные, советники, вооружения, в том числе ядерные, зачастую расположены за тысячи километров от Вашингтона. Не говоря уже о том, что военные авантюры США унесли десятки и сотни тысяч жизней граждан стран, куда они несли мир и демократию. США неоднократно, в том числе последние годы, применяли силы в отношении других государств без санкций Совета Безопасности ООН. В их арсенале односторонние санкции и принудительные меры, угрозы, исполнять которые, как приговор некого Верховного Суда, они пытаются заставить всех. Согласно данным американских экспертов, 84 из 193 стран-членов ООН в той или иной степени подвергались оккупации или агрессии США, а в 191 государстве в 20-21 веках так или иначе размещались американские войска. По общедоступным в интернете данным, США содержат около 750 военных баз в более чем 80 странах мира. Общее число разрешен, размещенных за рубежом военнослужащих США за границей 175 тысяч. 175. Из них более 60 тысяч в Европе. Объем военного бюджета США в 2020 году составил 700, 778 миллиардов долларов. 778. Российского 61 миллиард, то есть меньше, чем 12 раз. Вот это примеры совершенно очевидные и конкретные угрозы международному миру и безопасности. Что же касается призывов урегулировать кризис вокруг Украины, то мы двумя руками за. Но у этого кризиса есть только одно измерение внутри украинской. Исправить ситуацию можно исключительно через выполнение Киевом уже упомянутых но и минских договоренностей, предусматривающих прежде всего прямой диалог с Донецком и Луганском. Другого пути нет. И если наши западные коллеги подталкивают Киев к саботажу минских договоренностей, чем украинские власти охотно пользуются? Чем украинские власти охотно пользуются? то это может закончиться самым плачевым образом для Украины. И не потому, что кто-то ее разрушит, а потому, что она разрушит себя сама. И Россия здесь абсолютно ни при чем. Не пытайтесь перекладывать вину с больной головы на здоровую. Обо всем об этом, однако, мы подробно поговорим 
17 февраля в ходе давно запланированного нами ежегодного заседания Совета Безопасности по выполнению резолюции 2202. Благодарю вас. I thank the representative of the Russian Federation. I give the floor to the representative of Gabon. Merci, Madame la Présidente. Je remercie Madame la Secrétaire générale adjointe Rosemarie Di Carlo pour son exposé. Madame la Présidente, mon pays suit avec beaucoup d'attention la situation qui prévaut aux frontières de l'Ukraine et de la Russie et a pris connaissance des informations relatives à une importante mobilisation de troupes russes aux frontières de l'Ukraine, laissant présager l'imminence d'une action militaire. Ces informations alarmantes sont accompagnées sur le terrain par une véritable effervescence assortie de déploiement de moyens financiers importants et d'équipements militaires de pays amis de l'Ukraine. L'escalade verbale et la vive tension qui en découle polarise une importante activité diplomatique qui se traduit par différentes initiatives, dont le format de Normandie, dans le cadre de la mise en œuvre des accords de Minsk. Face à cette situation de tension particulièrement préoccupante, mon pays, conscient des enjeux et du potentiel des forces en présence, appelle l'ensemble des parties prenantes à la retenue et à privilégier les voies du dialogue et de la négociation en vue de préserver la stabilité et la paix dans la région. C'est le moment pour la communauté internationale et ses membres d'activer les canaux de la diplomatie préventive tels que prévus par le chapitre 6 de la Charte des Nations Unies consacrée au règlement pacifique des différents. Il est évident que l'efficacité de cette diplomatie préventive est tributaire non seulement de la bonne foi des protagonistes, mais surtout du tact, de la sérénité et du cadre de sa mise en œuvre. La dualité de rhétorique, celle alarmante concernant l'imminence d'une action militaire en Ukraine, d'une part, et celle de démenti, qui est juxtaposée d'autre part, amplifie la fragmentation de ce Conseil au moment où les peuples du monde attendent de lui un consensus et une action résolue à la dimension des dévastations causées par les guerres et crises qui ensanglantent plusieurs régions de la planète. La force de ce Conseil réside dans son unité. C'est l'unité et non la fragmentation qui hisse ce Conseil à la hauteur de son mandat au service des peuples du monde. Nous croyons que la diplomatie, dans ses formes les plus pratiques et efficientes, est à même de ramener la sérénité aux confins de l'Ukraine. Pour terminer, je voudrais redonner écho ici à l'appel lancé vendredi dernier par le président ukrainien, exhortant à garder le sens de la mesure et à ne pas amplifier la panique. Je vous remercie, Madame la Présidente. I thank the representative of Gabo and I give the floor to the representative of Brazil. Thank you very much, Madam President. And let me also thank USG Rosemary Di Carlo for the briefing he has put forward uh, to the Council this morning. Geopolitical tensions and threats to international peace and security require the Security Council to engage promptly and timely. Open references to military actions, unilateral economic sanctions, and other measures are developments that should be avoided under the UN Charter. The Security Council must fulfill its primary objective, which is to prevent war. There is an, a general and urgent need to resort to meaningful dialogue with and between the parties directly involved in the escalation of tensions. We urge all parties to exercise maximum restraint and to engage constructively in talks aimed at resolving their differences. There is room to restore confidence and find a lasting diplomatic solution to this crisis. For that, we need political will and genuine commitment from all sides. Brazil encourages all parties to strictly observe international law. It is imperative to apply the principles enshrined in the Charter consistently in a non-selective manner. The prohibition of use of force 
the peaceful resolution of disputes and the principles of sovereignty, territorial integrity, and the protection of human rights are pillars of our collective security system. Brazil also highlights the need for good faith in order to address legitimate security concerns of all parties, including Russia's and Ukraine's. We encourage parties to pursue genuine talks on the implementation of the Minsk agreements. Security Council Resolution 2202, which provided useful guidelines to address the situation in eastern Ukraine, is also a valuable tool in the diplomatic efforts to overcome the situation. Brazil welcomes the resumption of talks in the Normandy format and the renewed commitment to the ceasefire in eastern Ukraine. Despite the sensitive and difficult nature of the issue on our agenda today, I would like to conclude with a note of hope. It has been encouraging to hear over the past few days statements to the effect that there is no military solution to the situation. At this moment in particular, this should be the motto of the whole United Nations membership and of the Security Council for a renewed commitment to diplomacy and prevention. I thank you, Madam President. I thank the representative of Brazil and I give the floor to the representative of Kenya. Thank you, Madam President, uh, for giving me the floor and also for the able way in which you have presided over the Security Council in the month of January. I thank Under Secretary General Rosemary Di Carlo for her briefing, and I welcome the participation of the representatives of Ukraine, Belarus, Lithuania, and Poland. Kenya abstained on the procedural vote to hold this meeting. We did so to reflect our contention that the main issue in question here is the impasse between NATO and the Russian Federation. We believe that it is imminently solvable and that the diplomatic steps underway already show promise. This, rather than escalation in search of a winner-take-all outcome, is what is required to support and protect international peace and security. <clears throat> Kenya has always maintained that the respect for the territorial integrity and sovereignty of all countries is a cornerstone of global peace. Where there are disputes regarding territorial jurisdiction or security interests, we strongly support patient diplomacy as the first, second, and third options. When the dispute is between major powers and regards the security of a third country, it is imperative that they embrace a spirit of compromise. We believe that the United States, NATO, and the Russian Federation have an opportunity to establish a diplomatic framework that will allow them to resolve their differences. Their security and that of the entire world depends on them willingly taking this step, not in ushering in a new age of containment, provocation, and proxy actions. Compromise is not surrender. The special powers given to the Security Council's permanent members demands that they embrace this principle if the United Nations is not to go the way of the doomed League of Nations. Africa recalls the rejections of compromise and the search for total victory that led to the Cold War. We experienced that Cold War as a series of hot wars and interventions that deeply damaged our dreams for peace, development, and competent, inclusive government. Our internal divisions and fragilities were weaponized at the altar of geopolitical rivalry. It confirmed the truth of the African saying that recognizes, when elephants fight, it is the grass that suffers. Madam President, given that the majority of the conflict situations the Security Council deals with are in Africa, 
We do not want them to serve as surrogates for a new Cold War. We in Africa, therefore, have a direct stake in de-escalation and renewed faith in diplomacy. We have serious challenges to solve together. Rarely has the world more urgently needed a United Nations that can deliver ambitiously. Madam President, Kenya believes that there is still plenty of opportunity for the Normandy format talks, the trilateral contact group on Ukraine, and the direct negotiations between the United States and the Russian Federation to produce a satisfactory outcome. We urge all these parties to ensure that their negotiations respect the security, sovereignty, and territorial integrity of Ukraine. Faith in innovative diplomacy may also allow for agreements between today's major powers inspired by the 1975 Helsinki Accords, which did deliver some stability to Europe during the Cold War. This time, however, such agreements need to advance the principle of non-interference to other parts of the world, and particularly to Africa. Madam President, in closing, it is critical that diplomacy and its acceptance of compromise as an inevitable outcome win the day. If there are future discussions to be held in the Security Council on this matter, let it be to announce a new era of cooperation. I thank you. I thank the representative of Kenya, and I give the floor to the representative of Mexico. Muchas gracias, señora presidenta. Y gracias a la Secretaria General Adjunta Di Carlo por su presentación. Doy la bienvenida a los representantes de Ucrania, Belarus, Polonia y Lituania a esta sesión. Señora Presidenta, empiezo por señalar que mi país considera oportuna la celebración de esta reunión en apego a nuestros principios de política exterior y además pertinente, toda vez que el Consejo de Seguridad debe ser informado sobre la situación que prevalece en Ucrania. No está en nuestro interés contribuir a polarizar aún más la narrativa, así que me limitaré a señalar lo que para México constituyen principios básicos para abordar el asunto en cumplimiento con la Carta de las Naciones Unidas. Para el caso, me referiré a tres de ellos. La proscripción de la amenaza o el uso de la fuerza en las relaciones internacionales, el principio de no intervención y la solución pacífica de las controversias. Respecto del primero, la sola escalada de tensiones en Europa Oriental representa una amenaza potencial para la paz y la seguridad internacionales y, por tanto, es competencia de este Consejo de conformidad con el artículo 39 de la Carta. Por eso mismo, y en virtud de la desconfianza que prevalece, es importante tratar de evitar cualquier tipo de acción que pueda considerarse hostil por cualquiera de las partes y por pequeña que parezca. Pero resulta alentador, sin duda, lo que acabamos de escuchar por parte del representante de la Federación de Rusia. Ha sido muy claro al reiterar aquí que no hay ninguna invasión prevista en Ucrania. Creo que he citado textualmente lo que dijo. Qué bueno que así sea. Es una declaración unilateral de no agresión. Y México sostiene, junto con lo que ha dicho el secretario general y otros aquí en esta sala, que no existe una solución militar en este asunto. Por el contrario, deben privar la diplomacia preventiva y el diálogo como vías de distensión y como hemos escuchado, existen de hecho para ello diversos canales, 
las conversaciones en Ginebra, el grupo trilateral de contacto y el formato de Normandía. En cuanto a la no intervención, reiteramos la importancia de respetar la soberanía, la unidad y la integridad territorial de Ucrania en apego irrestricto al derecho internacional, a la Carta de la ONU y a la Resolución 2625 de la Asamblea General. Corresponde asimismo a este Consejo de, de Seguridad determinar en su caso la existencia de un acto de agresión conforme a la Resolución 3314 de la Asamblea General. A lo anteriormente dicho, se refuerza el, con el principio de la solución pacífica de las controversias. Los estados tienen el deber de resolver sus controversias por medios pacíficos, como lo establece el derecho internacional. México ha defendido, defiende y continuará defendiendo la diplomacia por encima de la fuerza y las vías diplomáticas para el caso que nos ocupa siguen abiertas, no se han agotado. Señora Presidenta, lo que no debe ponerse en duda es la responsabilidad de este Consejo para cumplir con sus tareas preventivas, para estar a la altura que las circunstancias le exigen. Y creo firmemente que al celebrar esta sesión lo estamos haciendo. Estamos cumpliendo con nuestro mandato sin excesos ni omisiones. Muchas gracias, Presidenta. I thank the representative of Mexico and I give the floor to the representative of the United Arab Emirates. Shukran al Sayyida Raisa. I would do bidayatan and ashkur al Sayyida Rosemary de Carlo, wakil al Amin al Aam, al Shu'un al Siyasiya, wa bina al Salam, ala al Ihata al Wafia. Al Sayyida Raisa, to tab a dolt al Emirat, at the Tawarat al Akhira and Kath, wa fi siyak munakashatin al Yom, na wuddu Turkey's ala al Jawanab al Talia. Awilan, تؤمن بلادي إيمانا راسخا بأن الخلاف القائم في أوروبا يتطلب الانخراط في حوار جدي مبني على قيم الاستقرار والتعايش والسلام بين مختلف دول المنطقة ونؤكد على أهمية التوصل إلى حل تفاوضي للمسألة من خلال الآليات المتوفرة وبدعم المنظمات الإقليمية ونشير هنا إلى محادثات هيئة نورماندي ومبادرة رئيس منظمة الأمن والتعاون في أوروبا والتي تهدف لبدء حوار جوهري بشأن الأمن الأوروبي والذي من شأنه أن يعالج المشاغل الأمنية للدول لدول المنطقة ونرحب بالمناشدة التي أطلقها الرئيس الأوكراني فلاديمير زلانسكي حول إبداء الهدوء ونأمل أن يتم البناء عليها لبناء المزيد من الثقة في المنطقة ثانيا ترحب بلادي بالإعلان الصادر عن اجتماع هيئة نورماندي بتاريخ 26 يناير والذي أكد فيه كل من الاتحاد الروسي وجمهورية أوكرانيا عزمهما على تنفيذ وقف غير مشروط لإطلاق النار في شرق أوكرانيا ونعول على المبادرات المختلفة الجارية حاليا لإتاحة الفرصة للحوار بما في ذلك بين الولايات المتحدة والاتحاد الروسي حيث يجب مساندة الجهود الدبلوماسية القائمة وإعطاؤها المجال لتحقيق لتحقق النتائج المرجوة وكذلك تشدد بلادي على أهمية الحفاظ على الأمن والاستقرار وعلى محورية اتفاقيات منسك وضرورة التمسك بها وضمان تنفيذها بما يسهم في الوصول إلى تفاهم إقليمي شامل يحافظ على أمن واستقرار الدول المعنية ويعالج كافة مشاغلها الشرعية ثالثا يجب تجنب التصعيد الذي قد يكون له أثر سلبي كبير على المدنيين ويمكن أن يفاقم الوضع الإنساني الهش في شرق أوكرانيا ومن هذا المنطلق نشدد على أهمية النظر في الاحتياجات الإنسانية للمدنيين والحيلولة دون تدهور الوضع الإنساني في المنطقة رابعا إن احترام القانون الدولي والتقيد به يعد أمرا أساسيا لضمان عدم تدهور الأوضاع بشكل أكبر في أوروبا الشرقية ونشدد كذلك على أهمية مبادئ السيادة والسلامة الإقليمية 
وحسن الجوار التي غنى عنها لصون السلم والأمن الدوليين وختاما السيدة الرئيسة تجدد بلادي تأكيدها على أهمية اللجوء للحوار البناء لحل الخلافات إن دور مجلس الأمن كهيئة مسؤولة عن صون السلم والأمن الدوليين يعد أساسيا في توفير منبر دبلوماسي يسمح للدول بعرض وحل خلافاتها سلميا وشكرا I thank the representative of the United Arab Emirates. I shall now make a statement in my capacity as a representative of Norway. Let me start by expressing Norway's strong support for Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity within its internationally recognized borders. This includes the Crimea Peninsula and its territorial waters. Norway is deeply concerned about the Russian large-scale military buildup near the Ukraine's border and in occupied Crimea. This is unprovoked and unjustified. Further escalation can have devastating humanitarian consequences. Through its harsh statement and unrealistic demands, Russia now challenges the security architecture in all of Europe. The crisis therefore not only affects the region, but represents a clear threat to international peace and security. Russia has repeatedly accused NATO of increasing tensions. I would like to underline that the alliance is defensive and voluntary. We do not seek confrontation. At the same time, we cannot and will not compromise on the principles on which the security in Europe rests. We stand ready to discuss security concerns. Norway supports the European security order based on international law and national sovereignty. We cannot allow this to be replaced by spheres of influence. Every country has the right to freely choose its security alignment. We call on Russia to de-escalate and to engage constructively in dialogue through the established international mechanisms in good faith. Furthermore, Norway underlines its support for the existing international frameworks for the sustainable and peaceful resolution of conflicts in accordance with international law. Russia has itself repeatedly invoked in many other council discussions the principles of respect for sovereignty and territorial integrity. Norway calls on Russia to now respect these principles when it comes to Ukraine. Thank you. I shall now give the floor to the representative of the United States who has asked for the floor to make a further statement. Good. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, I can't say that I am uh, surprised by my Russian colleagues' comments, but I am disappointed. Uh, Madam President, um, I cannot let uh, the false equivalency uh, go unchecked, so I, uh, I, I feel I must respond. Let me be clear. There are no plans to weaken Russia, as claimed by our Russian colleague today. On the contrary, we welcome Russia as a responsible member of the international community, but its actions on the border of Ukraine are not responsible. The threats of aggression on the border of Ukraine, yes, on its border, is provocative. Our recognition of the facts on the ground is not provocative. The threats of action if Russia's uh, security demands aren't met is provocative. Our encouraging diplomacy is not provocative. The provocations from Russia, not from us or other members of this council. We have made clear our commitment to the path of diplomacy. I hope our Russian colleagues will also choose this path and engage peacefully with the international community, including Ukraine. I say to Russia simply this, your actions will speak for themselves and we hope and encourage that you make the right choices before this council today. Thank you very much. I thank the representative of the United States. I give the floor to the representative of the Russian Federation who has asked for the floor to make further statements. Thank you, President. I don't plan to turn the meeting into a dialogue between Russia and the United States. We wanted to say all that we wanted to say in our today's presentation. But we are still not really understanding what are the threats угрозах, провокации, эскалации со стороны России идет речь и что нам меняется. Но, но да ладно, мы уже, я уже высказался по этому поводу выступления. Я хотел бы обратить внимание, что когда я слушал выступление представителя Соединенных Штатов, как мне показалось, я не услышал ни одного упоминания, ни одной ссылки, ссылки на Минские соглашения и на резолюцию Совета Безопасности 2202. И это, кстати говоря, очень показательно. 
Вот в каком контексте мы должны говорить об регулировании украинского кризиса. А Соединенные Штаты уводят эту тему в совершенно другую область. И, наконец, госпожа председатель, я хочу извиниться перед членами, членами Совета и не воспринимать мой уход как демарш. Те страны, которые будут выступать после, после того, как предоставить им слово, я иду на встречу с генеральным секретарем при двери нашего председательства в Совете, который начинается завтра. И, к сожалению, к сожалению не, могу, не могу перенести ее, перенести ее в связи с графиком генерального секретаря. Благодарю вас, госпожа председатель. I thank the representative of the Russian Federation. I wish now then to again remind all speakers to limit their statement to no more than five minutes in order to enable the Council to carry out this work expeditiously. I now give the floor to the representative of Ukraine. Well, thank you, Madam President. Uh, I would like immediately to uh, apologize that I may not be uh, within the five-minute uh, limits, especially given the length of the Russian intervention. I would like to express my gratitude to the Norwegian Presidency for calling this briefing of the Security Council, of the need of which I spoke exactly a fortnight ago with Her Excellency Foreign Minister of Norway during our meeting here in New York. I express our thanks to the US, who as a member of the Security Council in close coordination with Ukraine and partners, requested today's briefing. And of course, I express our appreciation of the presentation by Under Secretary Di Carlo. It's a duty and need for the Security Council to be fully informed in case of grave threats to international peace and security. What is going on along the border with Ukraine, where the Russian Federation continues its military buildup, falls under the above qualification. It is important that Ukraine's vote is heard today in the Security Council and is not lost in translation when the position of my country has been delivered by a foreign ambassador in the Russian language. I would ask the deputy of Vasily Alexeyevich to tell him that my leadership speaks its language, has its own ambassadors and spokespersons. So there is no need to interpret the words of Ukrainian officials in a foreign language, especially if it is done the way Humpty Dumpty Shaltai Baltai spoke of the meaning of the words. Even if Lewis Carroll appears to be a favorite writer of the Russian top diplomats. Against the backdrop of unprecedented sequence of high level diplomatic contacts in the past few weeks, a serious talk in the Security Council is required more than ever to present facts, to listen to each other's positions and concerns, as well as to outline further actions towards the escalation. The fact is that nowadays about 112,000 Russian troops have been amassed around Ukraine's borders and in Crimea. And together with the maritime and aviation components, their number reaches about 130,000. Another fact is that the Russian troops are also being deployed to Belarus for the Union Resolve 2022 joint drills to be held on 10 to 20 February. They include, in particular, Iskander missile divisions, S-400 Triumph and Panzer anti-aircraft systems, Sukhoi 35 Generation 4 plus plus fighters. On top of that, on 26 January, the Russian fleet started another military drill in the Black Sea with involvement of frigates, patrol ships, missile ships, assault landing ships, and minesweepers. This reminds us of the ongoing heavy militarization of the temporarily occupied Crimea, the Black Sea, and the Sea of Azov by Russia 
which poses a serious threat to Ukraine, all littoral states, and their wider region. Significant reinforcement of combat capabilities of the Russian occupation forces in Donbas is another worrying trend. Currently, these formation, formations consist of up to 35,000 personnel, including around 3,000 servicemen of the Russian armed forces, on command posts and in other critical combat positions. In the border areas outside government control illegal border crossings by cargo trains and truck convoys delivering armed supplies to the Russian armed fo formations in Donbass is a routine practice. OECE SMM reports provide ample evidence of various illegal activities in the border areas. No surprise, the restrictions of the OECE SMM freedom of movement are on the increase, in particular in non-government controlled areas close to the Ukraine-Russia border. On the 22nd December 2021, the trilateral counter group reached another understanding on resuming the ceasefire regime. Nevertheless, shootings, shellings, sniper fire on Ukrainian positions and systematic use of attack UAVs against Ukrainian troops have not stopped. We have lost 12 servicemen killed in action and 14 wounded since 22nd December 2021. Just a few days ago, on January 25, armed formations of the Russian Federation once again attacked the positions of the armed forces of Ukraine in the area of Pishchevik, Donetsk region, using an attack UAV. VOG-17 fragmentation grenades dropped from the UAV resulted in severe injuries to two Ukrainian servicemen. The current impasse in the consultations process within the framework of the TCG continues on practically all tracks. While the decisions adopted by the Normandy format leaders during their December 2019 summit in Paris remain unimplemented. Over the past year and a half, we have seen deliberate efforts by the Russian side to, out, to obstruct TCG activities and even to prevent finalization of the already agreed, including at the expert level, arrangements within TCG in the security and humanitarian areas. All this is, a is accompanied by Russia's stubborn denial of being a party to the armed conflict that has been raging for eight years now in the Donbas region of Ukraine, attempts to impose a so-called direct dialogue with these puppet occupation administrations, as well as refusal to engage in substantive discussion on political settlement of the conflict. The question is why all these Russian forces are there. We have asked this question on different fora, along with sending own clear messages. Ukraine is not going to launch military offensive neither in Donbas nor in Crimea nor anywhere else. Ukraine sees no alternative to peaceful resolution of the ongoing conflict and restoration of its sovereignty and territorial integrity. Yet we also see a surge in Russian disinformation campaign, including false accusations of Ukraine plotting a military attack. This is not going to happen. This is direct evidence of Russia's unwillingness to de-escalate and prepare to justify its possible further aggression. We are well aware of Russia's history of ploys and provocations, and we will do everything possible to prevent another Manila-type provocation by Russia. Once again, I have clear instructions from my government to reiterate today the absence of any aggressive intention, as well as Ukraine's strong commitment to peace. Today we have heard from the Russian side that they do not intend to launch a war against my country. Although one should rather speak about to launch a new phase of the Russian aggression. 
It is a very important message, as we still lack credible explanations by Russia of its actions and military movements. Based on experience, we cannot believe Russian declarations, but only practical moves on withdrawal of troops from the border. Madam President, Ukraine strongly rejects any attempt to use the threat of force as an instrument of pressure to make Ukraine and our partners accept illegitimate demands. There is no room for compromise on principal issues. The most principal position for Ukraine is that we have inherent sovereign right to choose our own security arrangements, including treaties of alliance which cannot be questioned by Russia. Moreover, this right is enshrined in many international legal instruments that Russia itself a party to. Ukraine will not bow to threats aimed at weakening Ukraine, undermining its economic and financial stability, and inciting public frustration. This will not happen and the Kremlin must remember that Ukraine is ready to defend itself. At the same time, we support the need to keep diplomatic channels with Russia open. If that prevents a shift to military tools, my president has reiterated most recently that he is ready to meet his Russian counterpart. If Russia has any questions to Ukraine, it is better to meet and talk not to bring troops to the Ukrainian borders and intimidate Ukrainian people. For Ukraine, the first priority today is to achieve a sustainable and unconditional ceasefire in Donbass. The ceasefire regime must be guaranteed, reliable, and on this basis, further steps can be taken. Intensification of the work of the Normandy format, including at the level of leaders of the four countries is an important prerequisite for next steps towards lasting peace in Donbass. And we are ready to resume Normandy 4 talks in all formats. The recent political advisors meeting on 26 January in Paris, despite many differences, gives a hope for a continuation of the negotiation process, which Ukraine will staunchly support. Madam President, we consider that despite the Russian attempt to impede the briefing from being held, the Security Council and the wider UN membership have received today a very important information. Information that the members of the Security Council need to take an informed decision when appropriate to act swiftly and decisively in, empl in employing preventive diplomacy under the Chapter 6 of the UN Charter that rests on the Security Council responsibility to investigate any dispute or any situation which might lead to international friction or give rise to a dispute. After listening to the Russian ambassador today, I would like to ask how long Russia will pressure, will pursue a clear attempt to push Ukraine and its partners into a Kafka trap. And still, I perhaps should acknowledge that it was important to hear the Russian envoy today. And yet, I must end with what my foreign minister has recently said, and I quote, if Russian officials are serious when they say they don't want a new war, Russia must continue diplomatic engagement and pull back military forces it amassed along Ukraine's borders, as in the temporarily occupied territories of Ukraine. Diplomacy is the only responsible way, end of quote. Let's judge by actions, not by riddles and semantic puzzles. Thank you for your attention. I thank the representative of Ukraine, and I give the floor to the representative of Belarus. Благодарю вас, госпожа председатель. Республика Беларусь продолжает занимать последовательную и принципиальную позицию о неприемлемости решения любого конфликта силовым путем. Приложив немало усилий для урегулирования конфликта на Украине, наша страна по-прежнему готова сделать все возможное для восстановления диалога и взаимопонимания в регионе. 
Альтернативы минским договоренностям, сыгравшим ключевую роль в мирном разрешении кризиса, нет. Переговорный процесс в рамках трехсторонней контактной группы, а также практическая реализация договоренностей в зоне внутриукраинского конфликта позволят вывести мирный процесс по Украине на устойчивую положительную траекторию. Внесение сегодняшней темы делегации США на рассмотрение Совета безопасности ООН представляет собой очередную попытку искусственного нагнетания напряженности в регионе исключительно в качестве инструмента политических обвинений. Подобные действия лишь усиливают недоверие и никоим образом не способствуют снятию разногласий. Несмотря на озабоченность, высказываемую неоднократно представителями Республики Беларусь на международных переговорных площадках и в ходе двусторонних контактов, наращивание военных сил у наших западных и южных границ не только не прекращается, но и приобретает угрожающий характер. Несмотря на неоднократные призывы к диалогу и сотрудничеству, в том числе и в сфере контроля над вооружениями, давление на нашу страну со стороны отдельных государств лишь усиливается. Предложения о возвращении к переговорам не находят отклика у наших западных партнеров. Я, кстати, хотел бы обратить внимание, что сегодня здесь, в этом зале, звучали ссылки на Будапешский меморандум. Я очень прошу вас перечитать этот документ относительно Республики Беларусь и обратить внимание на обещания, содержащиеся в этом документе, не оказывать на Беларусь меры экономического принуждения и при этом вспомнить те пакеты, многочисленные пакеты экономических санкций, которые со стороны отдельных государств против нас уже были введены. С учетом сложившейся непростой обстановки, главы Беларуси и России приняли решение о совместном проведении мероприятий по оценке готовности вооруженных сил двух государств обеспечить военную безопасность с учетом обязательств военно-политического союза. В рамках указанных договоренностей принято решение о проведении в феврале текущего года проверки сил реагирования союзного государства. Главными целями проверки вооруженных сил являются оценка готовности и способности органов военного управления к совместным действиям по обеспечению безопасности союзного государства, отработка совместных действий по нейтрализации угроз на границах союзного государства, вызванных в том числе миграционным кризисом и необходимостью стабилизации гуманитарной обстановки, Организация обороны и охраны стратегически важных объектов. Пресечение и отражение внешней агрессии в ходе оборонительных операций. Противодействие терроризму и защита интересов союзного государства. На завершающем этапе мероприятий в период с 10 по 20 февраля текущего года пройдут совместные белорусско-российские учения «Союзная решимость» 2022, в ходе которых будут выполнены совместные учебно-боевые задачи с использованием контрольных целей. Мы отмечаем, что указанные варианты применения региональной группировки войск в целях обеспечения военной безопасности союзного государства отрабатываются нами, двумя государствами, регулярно в ходе совместных учений всегда носят исключительно оборонительный характер и не несут никакой угрозы ни для европейских партнеров, ни для соседних стран. Республика Беларусь продолжает неукоснительно соблюдать все взятые на себя обязательства в рамках международных и региональных договоров по контролю над вооружениями. Кстати говоря, вся информация о предстоящих военных учениях содержится в полном объеме, на официальном сайте Министерства обороны Республики Беларусь. Несколько дней назад, 28 января, президент Республики Беларусь Александр Лукашенко, отвечая на вопросы, заявил, что война возможна лишь в двух случаях – при нападении на Беларусь, либо при нападении на нашего союзника Российскую Федерацию. Реагируя на различные инсинуации в адрес Беларуси, 
в преломлении к внутриукраинской ситуации, хотим еще раз напомнить, что мы готовы и далее оказывать все необходимое содействие в урегулировании конфликта на Украине, в том числе путем создания всех необходимых условий для деятельности трехсторонней контактной группы, а также для переговоров в любых иных возможных форматах и вариантах. Сегодня многие в мире говорят о необходимости проведения широкого диалога по вопросам международной безопасности. С инициативой проведения подобного диалога под условным названием «Хельсинки-2» президент Беларуси Александр Лукашенко выступал еще несколько лет назад. Эта идея, к сожалению, до сих пор так и осталась нереализованной. Республика Беларусь искренне заинтересована в скорейшем урегулировании регионального кризиса исключительно на основе диалога и взаимного уважения. Благодарю вас. Poland is grateful for convening today's meeting on the Security Council as we are, we are increasingly concerned with the Russia's continuous large-scale military build-up on the border with Ukraine, both in the territory of Russia but also in the territory of Belarus, including continuous redeployments of troops, pre-positioning of military hardware and offensive weapons. We cannot keep quiet because what is happening in our neighborhood constitutes a serious threat to international peace and security reaching far beyond our region and continent. The current security situation in Eastern Europe unfortunately follows a pattern of precedents with the Russian Federation being the destabilizing actor in the region at least since 2008 and the war in Georgia through 2014 and illegal annexation of the Crimean Peninsula. As we speak, the frozen conflicts in Eastern Ukraine, in the Georgian breakaway regions of Tsin Valley and Abkhazia, and in the Transnistrian region of the Republic of Moldova are un un unresolved, undermining the stability and regional security of this part of the world. Madam President, we cannot keep quiet because what is happening in our neighborhood constitu constitutes the outright violation of the fundamental principles enshrined in the UN Charter. Poland deeply adheres to the principles of international law, such as sovereignty and territorial integrity of states, the availability of frontiers, and then use or threat of force. And we, cannot, and we call upon all member states to act in the same spirit. We know very well from our country's history that the political order based on the spheres of influence brings no positive results. It is here in the United Nations when we, where uh, it's our duty to protect the principles of international law, strongly condemn any threat of use of force, and work together to dismantle spheres of influence in order to maintain peace. What is at stake today is not only the subordination of Ukraine and the creation of the so-called buffer zone in Eastern and Central Europe. The real threat is, threat is to shake the very foundation of the security architecture in Europe by undermining such tenets as of international law as unviolability of borders and the freedom to choose one's own security arrangements, among others. Unfortunately, this may have a global impact and contribute to the deterioration of international security, not to mention the possible humanitarian crisis. And there are, no, uh, and, and there are other revisionist powers which may follow the suit. Madam President, Poland deeply believes in the power of preventive diplomacy. Holding the chairmanship in office of the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, we stand open to facilitate talks on the European security within the organization. OSCE can provide the right venue to discuss matters of concern because of being the broadest of the regional formats. We call for constructive engagement of all participating states in order to find a peaceful solution to the current crisis. Let there be no doubt that the current status quo is not a solution at all. Living in a constant fear of another frozen conflict is against the commitment of the, these United Nations to practice tolerance and live together in peace with one another as a good neighbors. With Winter Olympics uh, just uh, less than a week away, uh, let us whatever we can, uh, let us do whatever we can to maintain the Olympic peace in the Eastern Europe. And I thank you. I thank the representative of Poland and I give the floor to the representative of Lithuania. 
Madam President, let me thank you for convening this meeting on such an important issue and for granting an opportunity to speak. I am delivering this statement on behalf of the Baltic states, Estonia, Latvia, and my own country, Lithuania. Firstly, let me reiterate our country's unwavering support for Ukraine's sovereignty, independence, and territorial integrity within its internationally recognized borders. We strongly condemn the clear violation of Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity by acts of aggression by the Russian armed forces since February 2014. We do not recognize and continue to condemn the illegal annexation of Ukraine's autonomous Republic of Crimea and the city of Sevastopol by Russia. We remain concerned over the increasing militarization of the peninsula, the severe deterioration of the human rights situation there. Let me add, in this context, that we welcome the establishment of the International Crimean Platform launched at the kickoff summit that took place on 23rd August in Kiev and support the implementation of its joint declaration. We invite other UN members to join this initiative as well. Madam President, the conflict in Ukraine has claimed around 14,000 lives, displaced 1.5 million persons, and has resulted in countless suffering on both sides of the contact line in eastern Ukraine. We reiterate our full support to the efforts towards peaceful and sustainable resolution of this conflict, namely in the Normandy format, the Trilateral Contact Group, and the OSCE, including its special monitoring mission to Ukraine. Yet, despite all international efforts, until now, we see little progress towards the resolution of this conflict. Ukraine's constructive approach has not been reciprocated by Russia. We condemn Russia's continued aggressive actions and threats against Ukraine and call on Russia to de-escalate the situation and to abide by international law. We call on Russia to immediately stop fueling the conflict by providing financial and military support to the armed formations it backs and to withdraw the Russian military troops and material from the eastern border of Ukraine and Crimean Peninsula. Madam President, despite all diplomatic efforts, Russia further escalates and continues military deployment around Ukraine's borders. Moreover, Russian troops are deployed in Belarus as well. This adds up to the current escalation and is of direct concern to us. Kremlin continues to use a false narrative that Russia is forced to defend itself from a threat even as the opposite is true. It is Russia who is threatening Ukraine and other neighbors by positioning over 100,000 troops. Russia is not a victim as it attempts to portray itself. It is the aggressor, strengthening its security at the expense of others. By its own actions in the Georgian breakaway regions of South Ossetia and Abkhazia, the Transnistrian region, the illegal annexation of Crimea, Russia has contributed to a significant deterioration of security environment in Europe. We reaffirm, reaffirm full commitment to the core principles of international security enshrined in the UN Charter, founding documents of the OEC, including the Helsinki Final Act and the Charter of Paris and others. This includes notably the sovereign equality and territorial integrity of states, the inviolability of frontiers, and refraining from the use of force. Their violation of, by Russia is an obstacle to a common and indivisible security space in Europe and threatens peace and stability on our continent. Times of limited sovereignty in Europe are long gone. Notions of spheres of influence have no place in the 21st century. States have freedom to choose or change their own security arrangements. No third country has a veto right over the sovereign choices of independent and democratic states. Madam President, in response to the recent tensions, the EU has made clear in the December and January European Council conclusions that any further military aggression against Ukraine will have massive consequences and severe costs, including restrictive measures to be coordinated closely with our transatlantic partners. Madam President, President, we call on Russia to respect principles of UN Charter, de-escalate, and engage in genuine dialogue. It is our duty as members of the UN to defend the rules-based international system. Violation of its fundamental principles, we have the consequences for other parts of the world. I thank you, Madam President. I thank the representative of Lithuania. There are no more names inscribed on the list of speakers. The meeting is adjourned. In what way I think that uh, it was, as I said in the meeting, uh, it is the duty of the Security Council to be informed 
So we sincerely didn't really appreciate an effort to obstruct the platform of, of providing information to the Security Council members and beyond. It is Chapter 6, be it pathetic to many, that says that it's the duty of the Security Council to prevent conflicts. So not to provide the Security Council members from the first-hand information about what is going on. We all see unprecedented transatlantic activity, people flying back and forth, back and forth, and you guys doing your job reporting about that. But it's also our job to inform the membership of the Security Council. You are here, right? Yes. So someone sent you here, right? Yes. So your boss probably is confident that the event doesn't matter. So the fact is that you are here, all of you, means that you still hope that the United Nations does matter as an organization. So, are there conversations going on or are there negotiations going on here in New York with you and the Russian ambassador and the U.S.? Well, as you know, the Russian ambassador was away for quite a prolonged period of time, so I had no chance uh, to talk to him. Uh, but as I also said at the outset of my um, intervention, the request from the United States came after weeks of back-to-back -back daily consultations in many, many formats. I mean, I met many, many. I met all ambassadors so far. Uh, the Security Council. I met many ambassadors outside the Security Council. Uh, different formats were taking place. So everything that happened was well timed and designed. And it was also very informed decision to have it today because you all s saw the sequence of many, many, many events. So to have this briefing prematurely would not be a good idea either. Absolutely. Because I believe that even you dealing with the daily challenges, be it family, job, whatever, you would like to deal with them being informed, aren't you? So please value the need to provide first hand information. And the responsibility of the ambassadors, that's what we are paid for, being here in New York. Ambassador, did you hear anything new from Russia? No, I didn't. I mean, uh, they are very consistent in what they are saying. I mean, uh, I can tell you almost word by word what they will say next month when they use the seat of the Soviet Union to preside the Security Council. And I can take for this purpose the speech of uh, Minister Lavrov to Duma less than a week ago. And is there some diplomatic solution you can see? We hope and we work uh, with the aim to achieve a diplomatic solution. I said repeatedly in my speech, I have instructions for my government to reiterate, we plan no offense, no military offense, not in our plans. Ambassador, but what's the difference with Crimea? I mean, how, how, how we will have the Security Council this time stop something that instead happened before and the Security Council was unable to stop. Including by providing information once again. I regret that when in 2014, even in 2013, starting from 2013, the foreign intelligence had all necessary information to collaborate the, what we were saying, that the Russian troops were amassing and moving in and the Secretary General then had no guts to act and to request a briefing in the Security Council. And when we had the Security Council uh, meeting, we wanted to have a resolution. The Russian Federation voted it, vetoed it, sorry. So I think that the more information we provide, the better. Ambassador, do you think that it's inevitable that Russia will invade? It is imminent, and read the definition of imminent. It is not exactly the Russian definition of imminent. I said how many troops you will see that uh, in the statement posted online. And what is your sense of what the Russian definition of imminent is? Well, I knew that someone would ask that question. 
And you know, in my speech, I reminded of the favorite uh, writer of the top Russian diplomats, which is uh, Lewis Carroll, right? And you remember Humpty Dumpty, don't you? Yeah. So what Humpty Dumpty said to Alice? Alice told, you know, Humpty Dumpty, I don't really understand your, de your definition, right? Your definition. What Humpty Dumpty said? The word means what I want it to mean, right? Luckily, we do have dictionaries. English-Russian Dictionary of Diplomacy. Imminent. The first meaning, published in Moscow. Nadvigayushisa. Navisayushi. And only then, niminuimi. Which means approaching, hanging over, and only then, unavoidable. So we have to work very hard so that the first two stay as it is, hanging over. The threat is hung, hanging over, right? And it's our duty, not, right. Go ahead. Uh, what makes, what would you like to see that the international community doing to prevent uh, further escalation? We had uh, quite important, I'd say, I would use this word, important meeting in Paris on the 26th of the Normandy Forment. A very short but still important, once again, statement was issued, including on the issue of ceasefire, including on the need to meet again in a fortnight in, in uh, Berlin. I need to remind you that it was the first uh, meeting of Normandy uh, format at the level of political advisors in more than five months, I think so. So if there is this continuation of discussions, that's the best thing to do. And we should not really panic, you know. And that's the message of my president, not to panic. Do you see a goal for the Secretary General? Are you satisfied with the way he has been dealing with this? Are you satisfied with many things around you? You are not. And it's very good because this dissatisfaction uh, is uh, a thing that pushes you forward for, for their achievements. I met the Secretary General. We had a very good discussion with him. The Russian ambassador left uh, the meeting of Security Council just a minute before I took the floor, allegedly to meet the Secretary General, and I'm, ho and I'm sure he does meet the Secretary General after his long absence, but in fact he went to see you, probably to impose his narrative before you see me. But anyway, uh, the Secretary General is uh, in a very close uh, consultation. He has his own spokesperson. So ask questions uh, uh, to his, uh, put questions to his spokesperson. But he is in close consultations, including with me. And we have some ideas, you know. And we'll see now when the Russian ambassador back in New York, if his ideas are workable. I said what I said in uh, my statement, that it is instruction of my government to say that assaulting uh, non-controlled territories is not our plan. All right? Ambassador, another question. You say that in, you were disappointed that nothing happened in 2014. What do you want to see happening now? I want all members of Security Council, all members of the United Nations to take a responsible stance you know, it is in the interest of everyone to prevent the war, or rather to prevent the renewal of an active phase of the military ongoing aggression. Everyone will suffer, even if you are far away from Ukraine. There are countries, you can Google, that depend on the grain supply, the grain, grain supply comes from Ukraine. Of course, if there is an interruption of grain supply, you can go to the markets. The prices are wonderful these days, and you can buy grain from another source. There are many, many, many other implications. Nobody needs this to happen. Thank you.
I said I was too busy listening at my colleague. Look, we call for this meeting to allow the Russians to give us an explanation of what uh, their actions are. Um, we didn't hear much. They didn't give us uh, uh, the answers that any of us would have hoped that they would provide. Uh, so we're, we hope that they continue along the route of uh, diplomacy and find a solution uh, uh, a way forward so that Ukraine can uh, feel uh, comfortable and secure in its own borders. Have you got any, any sense that there is some positive view that there may be a diplomatic breakthrough either here or? Well, I think the, the council meeting was clear and all of the voices, even those who abstained on, on the votes, spoke clearly about the importance of the UN Charter and the importance of countries having the ability to feel comfortable within their own borders. And several raised concerns uh, about uh, Russian actions. So I think we accomplished uh, that today. Russia heard clearly uh, a united uh, uh, position from the vast majority of, of the council, and I hope that that will lead to a diplomatic solution. Thank you. But before everything, I do wish to say Happy New Year, a Happy Spring Festival for the Year of the Tiger. This is the New Year's Eve, and tomorrow we'll, we will be in a brand new year, the Year of the Tiger. Wish all of you happiness, good health, prosperity, and peace. Well, for China, we are uh, against a public meeting. Uh, this is really the right time calling for quiet diplomacy with more diplomatic efforts instead of microphone diplomacy or public confrontation. And uh, that's uh, the, uh, also the concern of many members of the council. We all hope that with our efforts uh, we can uh, avoid adding fuel to the tension. And what's uh, really needed, badly needed, is more diplomatic efforts. So that's, that's our position. So as a procedural vote, can the meeting be blocked, do you believe? Do you have to vote I think efforts are still being uh, uh, underway. Uh, uh, as, I, as far as I know, the president of the council, many uh, uh, members, including China, are all making efforts trying to uh, uh, avoid a public uh, confrontation. That you, uh, efforts are going on. Will you vote no or abstain? We will vote no. Uh, as I said, what we want is quiet diplomacy. Yeah. Uh, I think we'll have a meeting on Ukraine. We'll discuss the modalities now. As you know, uh, we are very concerned with the situation um, uh, around Ukraine. Uh, what we uh, will do, I think what I will do is really call for uh, diplomatic uh, settlement, diplomatic talks. As you know, France and Germany have been strongly engaged uh, on this one. The National Security Advisors met in a Normandy format a few days ago. There will be another round in Berlin on February 10. Uh, President Macron uh, has been uh, talking to President Putin, President Zelensky. So uh, we will uh, do whatever we can to uh, promote the escalation. And this is very much the spirit into which uh, I will participate this morning to this meeting, uh, urging everyone to de-escalate, to go back to the negotiating table, to address the core issues which are uh, on the table and to negotiate. So this is very much what, uh, what uh, I have in mind, what we have in mind. Ambassador, do you think the majority of the Security Council think there should be a meeting today? Because Russia is talking about pushing this to a procedural Yeah, I vote. think, you know, these are, you know, uh, in a way, these are little details, procedural vote, who votes, etc. I think there will be a meeting, and uh, I think Council members will speak. And uh, I think uh, we will be able to get our messages through. And uh, I really hope that we can uh, go back to the negotiating table uh, outside of New York, of course, uh, as soon as possible. Okay. Thank you. So, Thank you very much. Yeah.